Hi, and welcome to Kunsung Payol Jolene. We're so happy to have you join us this evening, Wednesday evening, for another teaching by Jetsuma Akamamo. This begins another series that Jetsuma gave. This was a five-part mindfulness in everyday life retreat. So um, this is part one of five. The others will be on Wednesday evenings as well. Um, I think you'll, I think you'll find this. I hope you'll find this helpful. I shouldn't tell you what you'll think, so I won't. Um, enjoy it, and here we go. This weekend, we're going to talk about mindfulness in its many aspects. I think that if we were to speak about mindfulness, we could not go too deep, too deeply. We could not spend enough time on it. It's one of those subjects that one can, uh, one can take to the depth of one's practice. One can really go to the depths of one's practice using mindfulness. Its many aspects display themselves in different kinds of practice. One of the things that's very unique about the Buddha Dharma is that it's not a Sunday go to meet in religion. <coughs> it's not the kind of religion where you go on Sunday and Christmas and Easter or whatever, you know, your particular holiday has to be, and then the rest of the year you're kind of, that, well, that's in a separate box, and the rest of the year you're kind of where you are. Buddhism is different in that is it is a path. In a way, it's a it's a it's a non-religious religion. You have to think of it as a path that one walks consistently, faithfully, deeply. There is relatively little benefit from practicing Dharma in a superficial way. That is to say, learning one or two mantras and walking around saying some prayers and really not training the mind in a deep and profound sense of the view and of mindfulness. If this depth is not reached, it seems as though our practice can be a lot more superficial, a lot less effective, and also our tendency is to become kind of like not remaining moist on the path, but drying up, if you, if you can get what I mean. The heart dries up. We, uh, if there is not that profound investment in establishing the view and in establishing mindfulness, the result will be greatly weakened, greatly crippled. So I'd like to talk about that at great length. One aspect I'd like to talk about first is, is well, before I talk about the first aspect, let me say that for Westerners particularly, because of the nature of our culture. There are so many different things to do in our culture. We are inundated with philosophies, religions old and new. Uh, we are uh, inundated with different kinds of experiences that people are calling spiritual. Um, uh, the reason why I'm so mindful of this is because I'm living in Sedona right now, and Sedona's kind of known for that. Um, the uh, people mistake any kind of experience that feels deep within them for, for, a, for a, a, a spiritual experience, not able to discriminate between something that feels spiritual and something that is an actual commitment and movement on one's path. There really is a difference between a mantra and a back rub. You know, there really, you'd be surprised. 
there really is a difference between you know the different experiences that people have that they call spiritual and an actual path that one practices consistently with the intention of benefiting beings this lack of spiritual discrimination is the greatest problem that we have not only in Sedona but here also it's the greatest problem that we have as Westerners and again it's symbolically you can see how it is even to go to the grocery store you know if if you send your child to the grocery store to buy bread you'll have to specify what kind of bread what brand of bread that sort of thing because on the shelf are a million different kinds of bread and other cultures might be a little bit different than that especially third world cultures there are there is more the sense that when you go to buy bread you buy the bread they have <laughs> and and that's pretty much it bread is bread in the same way their faith is their faith it, it's not something that one tastes and tries and then tries on something else that discrimination is sort of built into the culture we don't have that so our need to practice discrimination is much stronger we have a tremendous need for that discrimination is best practiced through changing one's habitual tendency on the path of Buddha Dharma if you really kind of step back from it and look at the different categories of practice you'll notice that basically what the Buddha Dharma is about what the path is about is applying the actual exact antidote to the subtle and gross forms of suffering that we endure that is to say uh, on the path of Buddha Dharma uh, again the Buddha has taught, taught us that we suffer mostly from desire and that suffering is ongoing and that it's all pervasive but we also notice that that desire takes many different forms and there are and there are practices in the Buddha Dharma that are meant to pacify pride and ego and that ego clinging self cherishing there are practices in Dharma that are meant to apply the exact act antidote to a lack of generosity to selfishness and greediness and just wanting 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 that kind of suffering there are practices in the Buddha Dharma that are meant to help us to shake ourselves out of the kind of slothful mental attitude that so many of us have almost that kind of um, sleepwalking thing that we do through the days and years of our lives so often and th th it's actually a quality of mind uh, in Buddhism it's labeled ignorance it's not ignorance is not lack of education in Buddhism uh, it's lack of wisdom and so that that reactive mind the slothful mind the mind that doesn't <coughs> stop and evaluate and 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 use its energy to determine whatever direction it's going in that in the Buddha Dharma there are antidotes to that as well in fact when you study the Buddha Dharma you really have to think about the Buddha as being like a doctor and samsara as being like the sickness and the Dharma is kind of like the nurse that feeds it to you you know all the time and the Lama changes the bedpans. No, just kidding. <laughs> it's happened. So, so, in the spiritual discrimination that we're trying to practice, it isn't a theoretical, out there kind of vague idea. This idea of mindfulness, of discrimination, actually needs to be practiced in a very exacting way considering the fact that once again we are in a culture that goes in exactly the opposite direction we are in a culture that does not teach discrimination really in any form particularly about uh, spiritual issues so how 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 can we practice how can we 
formulate a method by which we can begin to grow distinct, distinct, uh, um, the ability to distinguish. How can we uh, learn to discriminate between what is truly, what is truly of the mind of the Buddhas and what is ordinary and simply arising from the phenomena of samsara? <coughs> How can we discriminate that? What is the method by which we can actually establish the view? Well, in the Buddha Dharma, we are always looking to apply an exact antidote. You have to think about samsara as being like a poison and that there is an exact formula that is the antidote to that poison. So. In trying to develop discrimination and mindfulness, it is best if we really hold ourselves to a kind of ritual or task that is evident and visible. Now, you might be saying, well, okay, what, what does that mean? I, I don't understand that. Well, give us a minute, we'll explain it all. The, the one of the greatest, one of the strongest antidotes to being stuck on the idea of self-nature as being inherently real, which is really quite different from enlightenment, one of the strongest antidotes for lack of spiritual discrimination, for not being able to tell in a spiritual sense the difference between a diamond and a piece of cut glass. Uh, that one very powerful antidote to that actually is called Guru Yoga. Now Guru Yoga on the Vajrayana path is extraordinarily important. Not because the Guru needs it, trust me on this. <laughs> Not because it's even pleasant or fun for the guru, not because of any ridiculous, superficial, or stupid reasons like that. The reason that we practice guru yoga is because our minds, when they are samsaric and when they are fully engaged in the cycle of birth and death, which we, you know, which all sentient beings are, when we are fully engaged in that way, is in a sense the consciousness is sort of a little bit like deadened, sort of flat line, if you will. Engaging in a relationship between oneself, which appears separate, and other, just the energy, the pulse of that relationship and the kind of feedback loop that it constantly creates, this, this, this non-recognition of phenomena as being actually a display of our own mind streams. This kind of engagement makes for a kind of dullness and stupor so that it is so like us to take maybe a spiritual minister or presenter of some kind and because they have tremendous charisma, because they have really slick words, because they have a real routine going, we would really put them in high regard and think, oh, this must be the word of God, or this must be the word of spirit, or, or whatever it is, that kind of thing. There is the inability to discriminate that between that and something we would probably miss entirely, which would be if a very deep practitioner a silent bodhisattva, one who has not been recognized, not on display, were actually to walk in the room, we wouldn't, we wouldn't sense that. We wouldn't know that because there's no display or no show. Even in my work, really, um, one of the methods that we use, this throne is not because I like it. Actually, it's kind of uncomfortable. Um, this throne is not because it's pretty and it's, it's not, it's not for any superficial reason, the Lama sits higher in order to indicate to the student the difference between this speech and the speech we hear every day. So in your mind, in the, in the student's mind, the throne is high and that's a, it's, a, it's a reminder 
this is a clear indication that in our lives we need some kind of ritual or some kind of visible habitual pattern that we engage in order to develop true spiritual discrimination. The mistake that we're making is the same mistake we're making with almost any practice. We're waiting for it to affect us. We're waiting for the feeling, you know. And then when, when Dharma is supposed to sweep you away like a Calgon bath or something. <laughs> And, and that's not the way it's ever going to happen. I mean, you may have wonderful, sweepy experiences, but you'll do that in your bathtub, too. It's, um, you know, it's just normal. The, I'm talking about something really completely different. What I'm talking about is the kinds of practices that we are taught to do in the Vajrayana path that are different and unique for us, in, for, our, for our culture. A Westerner at first feels very strange performing prostrations. We feel all goofy and foolish and, 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 and we're like, wait a minute, I, I mean, I don't even know if I like her yet, you know. <laughs> I mean, just because she's on the big chair. <laughs> but that's exactly why we do the prostrations, because she's on the big chair. And the big chair is there because the big chair is the throne of Dharma. It's not my throne. It's not Alicioli's throne. It's not Akanlamo's throne. It is the throne of Dharma. When we perform the prostrations that we do, it is actually meant to be a connection between body, mind, and speech. These three are utilized together. The physical is doing something, the speech is doing something, and hopefully, hopefully, <laughs> the mind is doing something. For the three, these three aspects of ourselves to, to perform at the same time makes a sense of connection. It, it is, it is a, a ritual that anchors something that is subtle, very spiritual, very, you can't taste it, you can't own it, you can't pick it up. It anchors it into the physical. The body is made to, when the body performs the prostrations, you literally go into a different space. That event involving body, speech, and mind takes you into a different space. Hopefully, again, if all three are engaged. So, and there are many mannerisms associated with Dharma, and we think as Westerners, well, I don't get that whole crouching over thing, you know? It, it just looks like hunchback to me. And uh, because Westerners, we're taught, walk straight, right? Almost military, be pri prideful, you know, that kind of thing. But actually, the constant mindfulness that when you are in the presence of the Lama and the Lama is, th there is an exchange of some sort. It's not that you have to be unnatural all the time, but, but if there is an exchange of some sort, simply that subtle tendency of just, just, just doing that, that little thing, that very little thing, with a mindfulness, and that's the trick, of what it should mean, puts the Lama's speech in a place where you can hear it more directly. It actually establishes the connection between you and the teacher, almost like a tube, you know, a direct tunnel between you going between yourself and the teacher. Whereas, if you were in a room full of pe people and your root guru was talking and other people were talking and you're listening to everybody at the same time, which is kind of like life, <laughs> at, you know, if you were listening in the same way and in the same time, there is no blessing there. There is no blessing there. And the reason why that is, is because the main point of practicing Guru Yoga is that eventually we'll come to see the non-duality in the nature of the Lama and one's own nature. And at that point, one actually takes refuge in that nature, which is one's own nature, 
every bit as much as it is the Lama's nature. But by that time, we are past the point of pridefulness. We are past the point of the lack of discrimination that makes us not know whether something is extraordinary or simply ordinary. So this training is actually a mind training. And once again, Westerners have a hard time with that and we keep trying to slip off of it. The slipping off of it is because, again, we're naturally sort of uncomfortable with it. It doesn't look like the rest of our culture. And we truly don't understand. We try to take our clues from the Lama. And this is where we are all wrong. Because some Lamas, like Jiao Rinpoche, come in like funky, humble guys, you know? And other Lamas come in like they're your best friend. And so what? They look eagle. And then other Lamas come in and they have a very fine and royal kind of, you know, genteel kind of appearance. It's, it, there are so many different Lamas. The trick is not to take your clue from the Lama but to take your clue from the Dharma, in this case, from the teachings about the nature of the Lama. Because whatever the appearance is, you need to form the habitual tendency and mindfulness of elevating that in preparation for the recognition and awakening to, recognition of and awakening to your own Buddha nature. The reason why you can't see your own, why, you're, why, you're, why we're asleep, why we're not able to awaken as the Buddha is awake, is primarily this business of having the mind be so skimmed through the mixture of non-virtue and virtue, just thickened and coarsened. It's literally coarsened to where you know, the loudest thing is what we hear, and the loudest thing is our ego. The loudest voice is our demand, our desire, what we, you know, how we feel, whether our feet hurt or not. That's the loudest voice. The mind is simply not able, through these, these obscurations of being constantly involved in clinging to self-nature, as inherently real, the mind is simply not able to distinguish. And so the practice of Guru Yoga is for you, not for the teacher. It's, I have found it to be very inconvenient. To get across the room when people are trying to prostrate is very difficult. <laughs> you know, to, I mean, all the stuff that goes with being a Lama, I, 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 I really do come from Brooklyn and I care about that stuff. And the only reason why I teach it the way I do with such a fervent energy is because I know how it works. And I know the power of that kind of practice. So regarding being able to discriminate in a spiritual way, the most important thing that you can do is to elevate the root guru, the source of how you have come to the path, the, the root teacher who is giving you these preliminary teachings, the one who hooks you, to elevate that teacher in such a way that you begin to awaken not to the appearance of the teacher, but to the nature of the teacher. Again, eventually, you will be able to see not your appearance, your own appearance, but awaken to your nature. And that's the goal here. That is the point of practicing Guru Yoga. Otherwise, no one else would care. Because certainly the, the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas don't need it. They're happy the way they are. You know, it, it, that's not required. So for us, we have this extraordinary opportunity. And in a way, the Lama offers themselves, the Lama offers themselves to be used in that way. And so you really, it behooves you to accept that offer. 
and one uses the Lama, it behooves you to take the opportunity to see that this is the appearance of Dharma in your mind, of Dharma in your life, and to lift it up within you, you know, in your mind, to lift it up, to see it differently from the other ordinary things that are in your life. To be able to distinguish that, to be able to get past the point where you say, well, now I like this about the Lama, I don't like that about the Lama, I do like this about the Lama, I don't like that about the Lama. <laughs> and let me see, um, he, she is good at this, he's not so good at that, <laughs> all that kind of stuff, because that's what you're doing about everything. That's what we do about each other, and most of all, about ourselves. Most of all. This mind training is meant to wean us away from that kind of conceptual proliferation. It is meant to allow us to begin to just taste the nourishment of pure view. Now, in, in my practice, I know most of you that know me for any length of time know that my practice is all about Guru Rinpoche. And there are many reasons for that. One of which is um, I have a strong, strong connect connection with Guru Rinpoche, and that's my great fortune and, and my great blessing. But in my mind and in my heart, there's nothing else. I can't, I don't see anything else. And I'm not saying that I'm a great practitioner, but I'm giving an indication as to how this could work, what kind of formula we can develop in our own practice, in our own quest for mindfulness. When I think about my practice with Guru Rinpoche, I look for him everywhere. I look for the speech, for the method, for the intention of the Guru everywhere. My experience has been that when I ask Guru Rinpoche for help, receiving strength, receiving health, receiving whatever it is that I need in order to be strong enough to be of benefit to others, you know, even though I haven't had the, uh, the from childhood training that many other Lamas have had, when I ask Guru Rinpoche for help with that, it is always there. I literally, there have been times when I have not known what my class was going to be about until I got there. And sometimes those are the best ones. And I really, and I, because I know that I am nothing but a vessel where Guru Rinpoche's blessing simply pours through. Now that doesn't sound, we're not talking about uh, being falsely humble, you know, like that. Remember that when you do prostrations, you always get up. <laughs> you know? We don't do this laying on the floor crap for hours. <laughs> we get up. And the reason why we get up is because that's what's supposed to happen. Through, this, through prostrating the body, through practicing this with body, speech, and mind, it is our nature that rises up. The ego lays down. We lay that down and the nature is what rises up. Symbolically, that's what's happening there. And so it's all about learning to have view in a different way. When we, one, one of the practices that we are taught as Buddhists is that always, always, Guru Rinpoche should be above the crown of our heads. We should always be mindful that Guru Rinpoche is always there, seated on his lotus throne, and that upon going to sleep, we should visualize that Guru Rinpoche becomes maybe smaller or becomes like light or liquid, and then pours into the top chakra and through the central channel and remains in the heart throughout the night. And we fall asleep with Guru Rinpoche in the heart. This kind of mindfulness is the best part of practice. No matter what else I do, even if I don't sit down and practice, I practice like that all the time. 
I mean, that's the, that's the, the backbone that I rely on. When I talk to any of my students, the way that I practice view is kind of like, as a llama, I consider that the students are higher than me. You should never do that, but I can do that. <laughs> I consider that the students are higher than me, because there are many of them, and I am only one. And our nature is the same. And it's a little bit like the posture of Jesus washing the feet of disciples, that kind of thing. There is, a, there is an element of sacrifice, there is an element of viewing the propagation of karma and the display of bodhicitta to be all there is, the highest. There's nothing else higher. So I practice in such a way that the student, students are higher. I hold them in high regard. They are more precious to me than other stuff that I do. And um, you know, um, people have noted that I'll go to great lengths for, for students that I have a particular kind of karma with. And, and that's why, really, because I can't put it down, you know? I mean, the students are really, I hold them much higher than I hold myself. What the student's job, however, is to practice that discrimination constantly. One thing that we should do is that we should consider that every event, every moment, every hour, every day, every breath has as its core nature Gurumpache, the blessing of Gurumpache, the appearance of Gurumpache. How does one practice that? Well, that's, it's the kind of thing that you have to grow into. You can't just all of a sudden think, well, I'm, I'm never going to think about anything else. I'm just going to think about Guru Pache from now on. And therefore, that'll be real easy. He'll just always be on my mind. Well, of course, that would make you crazy, wouldn't it? <laughs> Trying to force that little monkey in a cage to do what you want? Oh, you know what that's going to do. It's going to make you completely nuts. So you don't have to do it that way. How we start is by creating habitual patterns that include body, speech, and mind. We want to include these three elements. One way to practice this kind of mindfulness is should you have an altar in your home, well you should have an altar in your home, uh, whether the altar is in your room or whether it's somewhere else in your home. Perhaps in your room you can have a picture of by your bedside of Guru Pache or your teacher, you know, that your, your, own, your root teacher. Uh, that's a good visualization. One thing that you can do is that when you first wake up in the morning, the first thing you do, even before you go to the bathroom, the fir even before the coffee, oh yeah! <laughs> the first thing you do is to look at that picture and reorient yourself. This day, the guru is above the crown of my head. This hour, this day, right now, the guru is above the crown of my head. And you, you make three prostrations. And you have it in your mind that this day is therefore sacred. And then you dedicate that, the sacredness of this day, to the liberation and salvation of all sentient beings. No one can take that away from you. No matter what happens during the day, if you get hit by a car and both your legs come off, they still can't take that away from you. Even if you were to lose your life, the sacredness could not be taken away from you. Anytime you go into a specific event, whether it's ordinary or whether it's some sort of spiritual event, it really doesn't matter. If you're going to the grocery store to buy food for your children or your, your family or whatever, or yourself, uh, an excellent thing to do is to think that this, to, again, either glance at the picture or hold the picture of Guru and Pache in your mind, hold the picture of the root Guru in your mind, uh, reestablish the picture above the top of your head, and somehow know that this experience begins and ends with the guru. Gradually over time, even ordinary experiences that had no 
flavor, had no, no, no smell that you could connect with spirituality. There was no, there was simply no connection between this ordinary activity and spirituality. Eventually, over time, you will begin to establish more of a view and begin to see every experience as spiritual. Whatever job you have, whatever activities you engage in, look for the guru there. If you look, you'll find it. If you don't look, you'll never find it. But I find in, in perfectly ordinary experiences with that kind of practice, with that kind of discrimination, with that kind of guru yoga, amazing, amazing opportunities, amazing blessings come through the most ordinary experiences, through the most ordinary experiences. I mean, to the degree that if I see all phenomena as the mandala of the guru, and, and I hold to be in union with the guru constantly, ordinary people like gas station attendants will say things to you that will blow your head off. <laughs> I mean, that's happened to me where, where I've been, you know, in that frame of mind and, and looking for the guru and, and, and constantly mindful of that and you, you pull into a gas station and they say something that just rocks your world. And it's about something weird like renunciation or karma or something like that and you go, oh, I'm listening, okay. That happens. That doesn't make the gas station attendant your guru. You see the difference, don't you? But it, it does mean that that nature, that you are beginning to discriminate that nature, you're beginning to awaken to that nature. It's just a little, a little thread, but it's something. It's beginning to awaken to that. So, somehow we have to think of incorporating this distinction of what is extraordinary into our lives. It has to be a, an effort that we actually provide for and, and, and make substantial, you know, we actually create in our lives. The, th this opportunity to practice like that will never simply just come to you. I mean, you may just simply meet your guru, but that's because you practiced in your last life. That's because you practiced before. That's because you earned it. But once you meet the guru, once you are on the path, this practice of guru yoga becomes your responsibility. And to the degree that you really address it in a very profound and deep and heartfelt, fervent way, to that degree, it will benefit and it will awaken the mind. Guru Pache himself said, I will appear as your root guru. And that appearance is to be recognized. It demands to be recognized. One of the reasons why I harp so much on reciting the seven-line prayer is because the seven-line prayer is a prayer, the blessing of which creates the capability of seeing the guru in all things and of following the guru and of practicing in such a way as to discriminate that absolute nature. The nature of that prayer is to begin to awaken our inner psychic channels and workings and goings on and to, and to, and to bless our psychic channels and winds and fluids in such a way that everything within us that is the Buddha nature begins to awaken. That's the power of that prayer. And it is done through the recognition, the practice of recognition, recognizing and discriminating what is extraordinary. So in order to provide for that kind of recognition, we have to put a lot more effort into that aspect of our practice than we have up until now. 
Now, when you think about, well, maybe I'm giving you the that it's that it's all about Guru and Pache. Well, for me it is, but because, that's because maybe I've had, I'm lucky enough to have had enough teaching to have an understanding of Guru and Pache's nature. When we talk about the nature of the Guru, we are, we are talking about the perfect mating of wisdom and compassion, of emptiness and appearance. When you see the image of Gurimpache, you always see that staff, you know, the crooked in his, in his arm, in his arm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> dyslexic. And that, that is a symbol of his consort, that he is never separate from his consort. And the Lama and consort together, the meaning of that is the non-duality and union of emptiness and appearance of wisdom and compassion, or bodhicitta. That is the meaning of that union. So, Guru Rinpoche is always seen that way. We are to understand from that, then, that that is his nature. His nature is the perfect union of, the, of wisdom and bodhicitta, of the view of emptiness and the understanding of appearances. That and uh, the display of appearances. That is that is Guru Pache's nature. That that being the case, we have to find a way to not only recognize the physical form of the guru. You know, the picture that looks like Guru Pache or the picture that looks like your teacher. We really have to get past that and go into a deeper sense of trying to awaken and potentize our own meditation, our own understanding of the nature of emptiness and of the nature of appearances. We have to begin to potentize and practice and meditate in such a way that we see wisdom and compassion as being like the two eyes of our practice. The two eyes of our practice. So how do we do that? Well, I have some really good suggestions. And I hope you'll remember these. Sometimes when I give really su good suggestions, nobody writes them down. <laughs> and nobody remembers them. And then they don't do them. But I bet it's not going to happen tonight. What do you say? <laughs> All right. I have some excellent suggestions. Now, hear them all before you make any noises, please. <laughs> the first one, actually, I want to talk to the monks and nuns about how to keep this kind of mindfulness. This awareness of emptiness and bodhicitta as being the true meaning of one's path, one's practice. The two eyes, if you will. Somehow, we have to really embark more deeply on practicing a way to attain pure view. What keeps us from attaining pure view? Well, it's our egos, right? Obviously, it's our desire, our clinging, our egos, our constant need to recognize and reaffirm self-nature as being inherently real, and then the rest of it. We have to see that, too. And there's always the reaction going on. So these are the reasons why we are just so asleep in this narcotic state. So. As a monk or a nun, we should be constantly striving for a state of deeper recognition, for a better sense of view. How can we do that? We have all kinds of ideas about how we should relate with one another. We have all kinds of ideas about how we should um, conduct ourselves, carry ourselves. My suggestion is that we develop some new patterns, some new habitual tendencies, 
so that we can develop something other than that strong sense of I-ness, that strong sense of ego clinging. Remember that the point is to recognize what is sacred. That may not coincide with what you think. It may not coincide with what you want. It may not coincide with uh, the way you're used to doing things. But that's okay, because the point of practicing Dharma is to change. It's not, not to remain the same, right? Okay, now all you feminists, <laughs> calm down. Just calm down. <laughs> when the Buddha first taught, the Buddha first taught men. Right? Those were the first aspirants. Now calm down, I can feel it coming. <laughs> now you stop that. You stop that. <laughs> You see, I'm a girl, and you know me better than that. Oh, I can feel it. Do I know my kids or what? All right, so the Buddha first gave the practice to men. Now, there are all kinds of traditions about nuns being in the back and monks being in the front. And because we're all feminists and we're all girls, we don't like that very much. So we think everybody ought to be equal. And that's true. Everybody is equal. But regarding our practice, it really is like this. The Buddha taught men first. And so the idea is not to worry about what body we're wearing right now, what ego we're stuck in right now. In fact, to identify w with us being like ordinary males and females and to think, oh, females have to be there and men have to be there, or men, you know, this, this business here. To stay stuck in that realm is to stay stuck in ego. So for women to practice an honoring of men, and honoring of monks, rather, honoring of monks. Because it was the monks that were taught first by the Buddha. That's the reason why, not because men are better, but because the Buddha taught men first. They are our eldest practitioners. They held the lineage all this time and made it possible. It is the ordained male Sangha that held the full lineages, the full lineage of ordination intact all this time and made it possible for, for ordination to occur today in its fullness, both Genyan and Geelong. So that has been held properly by men. So as nuns, we should honor the monks. The monks, however, should not honor themselves. <laughs> the monks should honor the women, the nuns, because in pure view, she is the goddess. She is Tara herself. Her nature is indistinguishable from what is most precious to us. So as a, as a Vajrayana practitioner, women are elevated. She is the goddess, she is Tara, she is the spiritual consort. She is the one with whom we can practice in such a way as to overcome samsara. So she is extraordinarily elevated. So the nuns get to lose their egos by honoring the monks as the primary practitioners who through their generosity, morality, and kindness have kept the vows all this time and have made it possible for us to practice in the way that we, ha we are now. That should be something you should think about every time you see a monk. Good or bad. Get out of the habit of saying, oh, that one's a good monk and that one's a bad monk and you know, that kind of thing. When you see those robes and they're on a monk, you should feel exactly the same. Same thing with the monks. You should not worry about feeling that way about yourself. You're here. That's good. So the monks, when they look at women, 
they should not see a good nun or a bad nun or one that's dressed one way or one's dressed, you know, they shouldn't see that. These, these women who are holding the robes of the Buddha, who are practicing in that way, they are nothing less than Tara incarnate. They are nothing less than the appearance of the goddess. The only hope any of us have is to practice in spiritual union, whether that's on a spiritual level or on a physical level. And so when we look at the female principle, she is everything. And every time a monk looks at a woman, particularly a nun, he should see the goddess. It should be like that. Even if it's a laywoman. Don't, you're not looking at the clothes, remember? You didn't look at the robes, don't look at the clothes. See the nature. Behold the goddess. And in that way, kind of develop the habit of just doing that little, you know, that little, you know. Nobody has to see it, men. It's okay. It could be like one vertebra, you know. Let me pick a vertebra, just, you know. Somebody, you know, they'll think you got the rhythm or something. I realize what a hard time men have with that, and, and, and women too. And it's this battle between the sexes, but that is ordinary phenomena. And we're trying to get around that, past that, through that. The point is to carry the view. And so in recognizing the nature of one another, without holding ourselves in high regard, because we are so fancy, and without getting the rah-rah nuns or rah-rah monks thing going, because I've heard the nuns say, you know, the monks, they never support one another. They're not very nice to one another. They don't cook for each other. You know, they don't make each other's beds. They don't do anything for each other. Mm. That's what I hear from the, from the nuns. And the monks are saying, you know, the nuns, they're like sloppy. I mean, they're just like running around doing like, ooh, ooh, ah, ah, goo, goo stuff. All that hugs and squeezes and all that stupid stuff. They're, they're not very, not very together. So, you know, we tend to think a little bit like that. And we have these ideas. And it's that kind of thing that creates not only dissension on the Sangha, but it also, it's, it's ordinary view. What do you have to do with that? What is the point of practicing as you do without holding view? There would be no point. So... Likewise, for all students, when they see the sacred, whether it's a text or a statue, we don't worship statues, by the way. I thought I'd let you know that. Um, when you see a, t a, a statue or a text or a holy image, it is only an opportunity to practice. It is an opportunity for recognition, and recognition is the name of the game. It is right there with awakening. It's an, it's an opportunity to practice the view. Recognition, to get that coarseness and dullness out of our minds. So as regular practitioners, all practitioners, we should never, even for a moment, point our feet at a sacred image. And you think, oh, that's another culture. But no, it's not. It, it, there, is, there is a thing that happens when you're kicking back and you got your feet up and you're pointing it at something holy. The mind goes to sleep. Inwardly, subtly, you simply go to sleep. And believe me when I tell you, you leave yourself wide open for real negativity to come out at that very time. Because there was an opportunity for recognition and there was a choice of non-recognition. That puts more weight in the shit pile, not the Dharma pile. See, we have two piles, shit, Dharma. <laughs> Those are the choices. Just trying to be real clear about this. So, when we practice this non-recognition, we are going deeper and deeper into suffering. The mind becomes more inflamed, 
more thick, more loose, not a loose, loose meaning sloppy. In actuality, in some ways, it's very much tighter. Um, reactive, the mind is very reactive. Uh, when we practice viewing the sacred and taking that little moment to practice the humility of lifting it up, you know? Lifting up that sacred image in our minds. You have to pick up the picture. Just lift up that image in your mind and, and really recognizing that at that moment the mind is not concentrating on ego clinging. It is not concentrating on desire. It is not concentrating on how you feel or what you want or what you don't have. It is not concentrating on what you have to do next to make yourself happy. It is practicing something different and every opportunity is a good one. Particularly the opportunity of recognizing the sacred in one's life when, when you're walking around not practicing at all or not visibly practicing. So we never point our feet at a sacred object or at the Lama. Uh, personally, well, I remember for a long time my leg was bad. I had a problem with my leg where it was very swollen and I had a hard time. I always had to keep it elevated for a couple of years actually. I had to keep it elevated and I couldn't pull it in. Now it's a lot better but it used to be that I had to, even in puja, taking empowerment from my teachers, I had to put my foot up. And it was the worst time in my life. I, there were times that I wished I could cut my damn leg off. There were times I really wished I could do that. And I felt that strong about it. I just looked down at that leg and go, what, what the hell use are you? I was sitting there like that. <laughs> so I got, I really felt very bad about that. So that was, you know, something I had to deal with and I, I didn't like that at all. It felt all wrong to me. Felt wrong. Uh, we, however, for the most part, we are healthy and we are able to practice in such a way that we do not point our feet at any sacred image. And this teaches us not to be slovenly in our minds, not to be forgetful, not to be mindless, but rather to be more mindful. And that is an antidote to, a, to suffering of all kinds. Furthermore, all of you know these basic rules, or at least maybe most of you do, um, Dharma texts should never be treated, and, and this is interesting because we don't think about this, should never be treated like regular texts. Um, you should, they should always be lifted up, they should never be on the floor, they should never be under you. Dharma is always held up, you know, because it is the path that the Buddha has given us. Not doing that brings a lot of obstacles because of this state of non-recognition, which is the root of the suffering. It's the root of the problem. Now, even you, you don't think that you're disrespecting the Dharma. Let's say if, if I have a Dharma book over here and I'm in a really tight seat and somehow I just kind of lean over like that, my elbow's on top of the Dharma book. Not good. Because it's that much, not because, the, you know, the Dharma book doesn't care. I mean, let's get real. And it's not about what a good girl you are, what a good boy you are. Nobody cares about that either. What it is is that non-recognition, that dullness, that sleeping state that is the problem. And every opportunity that we have that is taken to establish that is fruitful and very beneficial to us. Try to remember that you're not doing anyone else really a favor if you practice this way. This is for you. This is about you. The book doesn't need it. The teacher doesn't need it. The bodhisattvas and the Buddhas and the nobody needs it. But you need it. It's your opportunity to practice. So we're very, very careful how we treat the books. Even when we go into a book, the Dharma book, when you go into it, you know how when you go into a regular book, you turn to the right page and when you finish, you just close it? That 
thickness, you know, that non-recognition should never happen. When you close a Dharma book, it should be, you know, e even if you don't do it physically, like, you know, touch it to the top of your head like that, in some way, internally, subjectively, you should know, you should, you should be doing something like that, you know, putting it above the top of the head in some symbolic way in your own mind so that you're gentle with it and mindful. These, these precious pages, what would we do if we didn't have the prayer to the three bodies of the Lama? What would we do if we didn't have the organ prayer? What would we do if we didn't have the seven line prayer? We wouldn't do anything because we wouldn't have any practices. So this is so precious to us and this mindfulness really is important. It really counts. So thank you very, very much for joining us today and um, listening to this teaching. This was part one, if you join us late. It's part one of five parts. Um, that was a retreat that was given, uh, like a weekend workshop that was given in 1999 by Jetsama. So part two will be next Wednesday and so forth. They will be on Wednesdays. It's, um, so I hope you join us then. As in addition, we show teachings by Jetsama on Sunday morning at 11 a.m. from our pre-recorded vault of teachings. Um, and we have uh, for you, we have meditation on Saturdays and Sundays at 10 a.m. We have um, Medicine Buddha on Facebook Live, which is every evening at 7 p.m. Uh, it's a very short practice, only 15 minutes in English and a wonderful opportunity for you to bring all of your concerns and prayers and wishes for those, those people and situations and everything that you can think of that you want to put in for prayers. There will be people there joining you that will um, help you with that. Uh, in addition, we have a food offering ceremony called a soak that's every day. Um, uh, it's on Zoom. It's at 5.30 on Monday through Friday. Saturday at noon, Sunday at 2. And during that ceremony, we'll be offering a lot of food, and we also make dedications for prayers. All of the ones that have come in online and um, come in through any different means. People come and give us hand us pieces of paper and so forth. So there are all the various ways that we get um, prayer requests, we honor them in, in this ceremony. So hopefully you will um, take, you know, you can go online and request prayers and we will get those and put them in these ceremonies as well. So hopefully you feel um, connected here and you're welcome. Uh, inside the temple, we are still not open yet. I say yet, because it's gotta be soon. It's just got to, don't you think? Um, but we are open outside and it's really fabulous. You can go outside and enjoy the walking trails, the meditation gardens, the wonderful Guru Rinpoche statue that has been enthroned and consecrated just across the street um, at the entrance to the Peace Park um, at all the other statues and stupas and everything that has been blessed, consecrated and imbued with the spiritual um, weight that can help you in your practice. So take advantage of it, come and visit. We hope to see you anytime, anyway. And should you wish to um, connect with us in any way, you can go to, um, uh, you can email us at kpc at tara.org and ask us any questions. Um, we will get back to you. 
Uh, and also, if you want to make an offering to Jetsima, you can do so uh, through her PayPal account at jetsimagift at gmail.com. All of that is in the chat, so you get to take a look at that. So thanks very much. See you on uh, Sunday, I guess. Today is Wednesday. Or maybe sooner. Who knows? Um, take care, be safe, and know we all love you and your family.